Boa tarde. Dia de Yad Together, some years ago. Uh, Vim, uh, this film came... 28 years later. Your first work with Bruno, no? No. Bruno and I did American Friend 10 years before. When we were very young. <laughs> uh, and uh, this, it was a, a subject that you know the script was written uh, for the film, or is something that you knew from Peter before or something? Script. Which script? No, we didn't have a script. No, we didn't have a script. We had pieces. We had. Strange pieces, but not a script. And Peter had written a few things for me, but it was not a script. Peter had written some dialogues for scenes that he imagined might happen in the course of the film, like when the two angels sit for the first time in these in the BMW showroom and talk about what they did all day long. That was something that Peter had written, but there was no script. We never had a script. We had scenes and locations and ideas, but we never had a script. And very often we just decided the night before what we would shoot the next day. We, it was, the film in many ways was done like a poem from one day to another. And sometimes we had a dialogue by Peter and that was beautiful. And then we had safe ground, and sometimes we didn't have any safe ground, and it was like flying without instruments. Like, for instance, when we started shooting, we were not really ready. The angels didn't have costumes. Uh, they, yeah. Bruno and Otto did not yet have costumes. We did not know how these angels would look. So, for two days, we shot with the children. In the beginning of the film, there's a sequence with only kids. And we were still testing. You remember, we were still testing the wardrobe. And Bruno and Otto would come in, in front of the camera, with a new wardrobe. And we would film it. And then we would watch the kids, what, how they would react. And most of the time, the kids would laugh when they came in, and then I realized that was no good, this wardrobe. We had, like, armors, beautiful armors. And you could fly. You can actually fly. We had long white stuff, and we had long hair. Oh, God, it was... No, we had also wings underneath the coat, or little, little... Yes, he still cotton. has the scarves. <laughs> I don't know, you, you don't know how an angel is moving, what he's wearing, how he's walking, how he's looking. You, that's a complete uh, invention. So we, we made a kind of brainstorming. Uh, I mean, you are, how do you say, nourished by uh, Christian imagery. So you know, you have seen angels, but you have never seen a real angel. You don't know. It's a complete, it's, it's a matter of imagination. And that was the, that was good about it. So you had you no, know, you couldn't couldn't lean on anything that existed before. You, yes, uh, paintings and things like that, literature, but not. Uh, or we have never seen a real angel, <laughs> and we had to in, invent that completely. And that was very very beautiful to do. For instance, angels don't have biographies. <laughs> so normally, an actor like Bruno is preparing very meticulously, and he knows the biography of the character. But angels don't have biographies. They don't have unhappy childhoods and stuff. So, and yeah, but there is a book called The Who is Who of the Angels. So <laughs> I looked at where, the, 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 where he is situated, where the range of, of Mr. Damier is, and so that, you know, all this kind of things that could help uh, to well, I found your name. It, to make your imagination go. I found your name in the voice, who, Daniel, yeah, yeah and Cassiel. I found Cassiel was the angel of tears, and Daniel, I forgot. There's a book of angels.
and I found the names. I remember that when we finally had decided on these coats, these long coats, and the little tiny ponytails, and that was the only leftovers from everything we tried in wardrobe department, and then we were finally shooting, and we did one of the first scenes of, of Bruno and Otto walking outside in the city, and out of a sudden Bruno said, hold, oh, stop, 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 stop. No, Otto said that. And you were pissed off because you wanted to continue shooting, and Otto said, no, 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 we can't shoot. And he came to me and said, Vim, look, it's raining. I have raindrops on my coat. An angel can't have raindrops on his coat. <laughs> because when it rains, an angel doesn't get wet. He thought that. Right. So, what do we do? I think you decided that raindrops were okay with angels. Well, yes. Uh, once you're on Earth, it's all <laughs> you can't get wet. <laughs> No, I cared about walking. How do they walk? I mean, uh, what, what's it? This is in English. Hoovering. Yes. Schweben. Yes. So, you know, that you, you can't just angels out of like this. It's, it's so you, you try to do. Higher. Floating. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I thought they should float. But we see them walk through walls. So they could things they can do things that people can do. How, how did we get to this samurai uh, tale thing? I think we, we were talking about samurais. That was a Japanese. I think we samurai. had these long hairs, and then we realized the long hair was no good, and then we thought just keeping your own hair was also this little weak. So I think we invented this little thing, and they became very fashionable afterwards. <laughs> I mean, even... It's the power of movies. Yes. <laughs> Let's talk about serious things. <laughs> and um, it was your uh, second film with uh, Real Khan, no? And, um, and that's why you choose uh, Black and White? Or? The very first idea of the film was simply to be in Berlin and have and discover the city through these angels. And then I figured it would be a perfect film to be shot in black and white. And one of the very first ideas was that angels could, couldn't see colors and only when he became a human being he would see colors. And when I had this idea, I thought nobody else can shoot this but Henri Aleko. The trouble was Henri had already taken his retirement. Henri had already promised his wife he wasn't going to make any movies anymore. And he, Henri has taken his retirement two or three years ago. So I knew it wasn't easy and I flew to Paris and I rang the bell and his wife opened and looked at me and said, uh-uh. <laughs> and then she asked me in and, and Henri was very happy to see me. I think he was bored in his retirement and then he, I said, Henri, I have a movie and I want to talk to you about it. And it's, we're going to shoot it in black and white and it's about angels. And Henri's eyes got this big and he said, I'll be right back. And he went into the basement and he came back with a suitcase. Not to travel, but he opened it and this was all his black and white tools, his filters and everything he had collected to shoot in black and white. And his wife was very pissed. She knew what was happening. <laughs> she realized she couldn't help it anymore. And before I did anything else, Henri picked up the phone and called his electrician, his gaffer, who was three years older. He was already, Henri was 79 then and his gaffer was 82. And they had taken retirement together, and he said to him, Louis, we have to work. <laughs> so they both came back out of retirement. And we had so much fun with him. He was always on the set of kind of a magic box, yeah. standing next to Henri. And yeah, in the meantime, also having a certain distance of uh, respect. And so he was, and Henri was his master. He was, he was presenting his box 
standing there and waiting. <laughs> I, I don't really know oh, what was in this box. Instrument to, to measure light, I think. This, you know more about that. Tell them. Henri would not tell the electricians what to do. He would say, he would point there, there, there. And then Louis knew exactly what this meant and what that meant. And Henri and Louis would run and his young colleagues from Berlin would try to help him, but he didn't need help. He would put up a light and he would put up another light and all the young electricians were always running after him, but it was always finished before they arrived there. And he would run up the ladder, walk up the ladder and jump down the ladder. The young people would climb down the ladder and Louis would jump. And we didn't really need anybody else than Louis. And, and in the evening, the old two old men always went this way. They always went to dance every night. Because probably they knew when they had finished this movie, they would go back in retirement and would be at home. <laughs> so they were so young. I mean, they, for them, making a movie was being in a, with toys. And for them, the lights were toys, and the, the angels were toys for them. And Henri had these ridiculous ideas all the time, how a woman would come and sit on your lap, because she would sit in the chair, not knowing that the angel was sitting on the chair. <laughs> and so he, she could sit on Bruno's lap, and Bruno didn't like the idea, and I didn't like the idea. But Henri loved these ridiculous ideas <laughs> of making the angels invisible and visible. <laughs> Sometimes you had to wait uh, three hours, four hours for light, for lightning. And I came into this uh, circus uh, wagon and uh, <coughs> this beautiful woman was sitting there behind kind of a, uh, <coughs> a makeup desk. Or, and then so they said, well, we are ready, get, get to your place. And I looked and saw on, on the floor that I, I should I should stand there there's a little white cross tape but, uh, you know they were, <laughs> they were uh, I think uh, uh, about 150 obstacles this high was one this high was one so I had to uh, because because he was the master of grace which means he, between white and black <laughs> there were about a thousand different grays he created gray just as a color gray, darker gray, lighter gray, more light gray, 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 and this was all done. This is the source of light. And he put um, sticks on and made what we call uh, uh, the drapeau and things like that to, 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 to kind of filtering the to light. break the light. And so yeah, this for an actor to get to the play, his working place was incredibly difficult because it, and you, you were always the, about to destroy the work of the master. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, sorry. You, you remember the little circus wagon where he meets Marion, the little car that when he visits her? In the car, I counted what 20, in that little car, that, that was four square meters, six square meters, were 28 lights. 28 lamps with a million shadows, 28 little lights in this tiny little room. There was no place where they could put more lights, otherwise Henri would have put more. Yes. But 28 was about the maximum, and Bruno was right, it was very difficult for the actors to move because every place was occupied with another light. Because he was used uh, on the bus to do the films in studio most of yes. it. Yeah, Henri made the Jean Cocteau mo movies, you know, the old movies of Jean Cocteau. And he was, uh, and after four years, he was a little bit forgotten until Raoul and you take, take him back to work, you know, really. Well, he made himself unforgettable with this film, I think. And a couple of years later, we made a sequel, Far Away So Close. How is it called in Portuguese? Uh, but we're so close, what is it? Tão longe, tão perto. And Henri was then too old to shoot it, and his wife didn't let him come back out of retirement 
because he was not already 83 or so, but he came as an actor. And he, and he played, uh, he played himself. In the, so you see him in the sequel, you see Henri as an actor. Uh, in, in 20 years, you will come back like a VP, you know. <laughs> Bruno. Bruno will be the archangel. <laughs> <laughs> Any question? Let's make. Uh, I don't know if it's correct, but uh, Antonioni he participated in the shooting of the uh, uh, Stadt Bibliothek. Is it correct? Or? No. No. It, it had nothing to do with the movie. No. Okay. I wish he would have come. Thank you. No, he didn't take part in it. But he was there as a another archangel, yes. Um, I've got another question. Um, I think um, if if you are using the iconography of the iconography of angels with wings, um, that shows the audience that it's, it's an angel. But we had other options because um, um, at, at the time we could have used the, um, maybe superimpositions or um, other uh, technical ways to, to produce uh, angels that would would probably um, that would be more clear to the audience that they are dealing with an angel. I, I don't know. Were you thinking of other options? We didn't think of any other options than those that we can do in inside the camera. And all the effects when they become invisible or sometimes you see the wings a little bit and then disappear. All this was done in the camera. This was not any special effect. It was all in the camera and Henri insisted that we only use things that the camera itself could produce. So there is no blue screen or any other special effects. And, and, uh, and I like this idea that the cam that all these illusions could be produced inside the camera. And then again, I felt it wasn't all that necessary <coughs> and uh, that the angels, the presence of the angels was more, um, was more necessary as far as the look of the camera was concerned because angels are, in, when we made the film, in my opinion, were, were more like a metaphor of the better people that we could become. So the one thing I told Henri was that the camera had always to represent the look of the angel, and so the camera's job was to have a loving look at the world. And that, that of course, is very co complex and difficult and almost impossible. How does a camera have a loving look? But we all took this very seriously. and and try to imagine how a camera could look more tenderly at things. And that was almost more important than all the special effects and all the, the whole thing about the angels being invisible. It was the idea that the, the camera would translate the way they look at us. Your question makes me a bit sad because I think we were the good angels. <laughs> Why did we choose Peter Falk? Peter was an afterthought. We had already shot for two weeks, two, but maybe three weeks already. And uh, I was sitting one evening with my assistant, Claire Denis was my assistant. She's a great director now herself. Claire was my first assistant and we were sitting in our office late at night thinking what we should do the next day and we weren't quite sure, and I, w I had a bit of the blues. I think I thought, Claire, this whole movie is getting too serious. There's no no character in there who's really funny. The, act the angels, by nature, are more serious people, and well, every now and then you were a little lighter. But I said, how can we bring another character that would allow us to, for the angels not to take themselves so seriously? And I said, 
wouldn't it be great to have an ex-angel, somebody who did already what Daniel was about to do, and that would sort of allow us to be funny. And uh, the more we talked about it late at night, tired, the more we liked the idea. And then we said, well, let's cast an ex-angel. Let's try to find someone who could be an ex-angel. And that very night, Claire and I went through all the options, who could play an ex-angel, and realized it would be the best if it was somebody known by everybody, because the idea of the ex-angel would work better if it was a very known person. So we ruled out politicians, because we thought that wasn't quite believable. <laughs> and then we said the only people known all over the all over the world to everybody are actors, American actors. So if you find an American actor who we could believe went through his story and was an angel and became a human being, that would be fun. And then we thought, who, who is the American actor who we believe that he was an angel? And by deduction, we arrived at Peter Falk. <laughs> because everybody loved Colombo. Everybody in the world loved Colombo, and, and Peter was such a lovely person. I never worked with him, but I met him. So I, I said, let's try to get Peter Falk. That was the 3 o'clock at night. And uh, I had a phone number for John Casavitas. And I called John Casavitas. It was 3 o'clock at night in Berlin keep at night, but in Los Angeles it was in the afternoon. So I called John Casavitas and he actually answered the phone and I told him my problem that I was trying to reach Peter Falk and, he's, and he said, well, don't explain it to me. Here's his number, call him yourself. Give me the number. And then I had the number and Claire said, well, we have nothing to lose. Let's call the man. And that very night, five minutes later, I called the number of Peter Falk. And as soon as I'd done the last digit, the phone was picked up right away. It was as if he had been sitting next to the phone. And I was prepared to speak to an answering machine or to a secretary, but the voice on the phone was, yeah. <laughs> it was him. So I was very scared. And, and I explained my case. I explained, I'm a German director, I'm in Berlin, I'm making a movie, and I'm imagining a part that isn't written yet. And the part is an ex-angel. He didn't interrupt me until then. It was as if he wasn't there. And then he said, what? <laughs> it is what? I said, it's an ex-angel. And then he just laughed. He wouldn't stop laughing for five minutes. I was getting, I was getting really worried. And then he said, and the part isn't written, isn't written, and you want me to come to play it? I said, yes. And then he said, I did my best work this way. I'll come. Call my, call my assistant tomorrow and arrange for the travel. And that's what we did. And four days later, he was there. Unbelievable. He was truly an ex-angel. <laughs> Well, I have a couple of questions, but I'm, I'm going to be short. Okay, first, how much do you feel that there is Germany inside of the movie? Because, uh, well, for instance, you have, you have the angel of Walter Benjamin. He's a weeping angel. He looks to the future. Uh, he goes to the future, but looking at the past and uh, weeping, because it's so sad, and the angels that you create are not pow powerful enough to stop war and to, so to stop the, the, the man to suicide, to commit suicide. So when I saw the movie for the first time, I was pretty glad because I thought, okay, uh, that's, 
that uh, uh, saying that humanity is better than spirituality alone or uh, humanity and the senses and uh, sex and food and wine are great. But now that I'm older, um, I'm, I'm asking if it's not a bit depressive to have a society where people suffer and the only thing that angels can do is, uh, well, to, to be, uh, to give us a bit of comfort, but not really enough. It's like uh, weeping because we lost our parents, we lost our guides, and uh, the only thing that those guides can do is uh, to turn on the other side, to become themselves humans, you know? And so, uh, to, be, uh, to uh, synthesize, okay, to, to resume what I'm saying is that for me it's quite strange to, that uh, this movie is a German movie because you have all the things about the German idealism and uh, all this longing for transcendence. You have the cant of the perpetual peace, a lot of erudite uh, things. And this is a bit like a German critique of the power of the idealism, uh, a way of uh, getting back to the Walter Benjamin Angel, you know, is uh, an update to the Walter Benjamin Angel. I mean, yes, the Walter Benjamin Angel, it's, the, it's a drawing that Walter Benjamin had bought from Paul Play. And it's a drawing that I had on the first page of my script. I never really understood what the angel of history meant, but I loved what he, what I saw in it, looking at the past or moving into the future and, and being horrified by what he saw. And somehow I felt the powerless Angel was a much more powerful metaphor than the angel who could, the angel with the sword, who could actually um, beat the dragon. So, and all the angel images of warriors, because a lot of the angels as are depicted as warriors, I didn't really like the idea. I like the idea of the peaceful angel who actually would weep with us and would comfort us and couldn't interact, I like that much better. And uh, I don't know if the movie is so German after all. I mean, it's a, in itself, it's a romantic idea to have the angel want to become a human being. But that's almost like a universal story that, that's part of mankind's imagination. It's not particularly German as such, that idea. It's, it could come from any other culture that the angel becomes a human being. And uh, so I, f I don't know. I didn't feel like I was criticizing a German transcend transcendence, transcendence or romanticism, but I never believed so much in the concept of angel anyway. I really took them as metaphors for who we would like to be, the children we have in ourselves, who we have buried in ourselves but who could still be alive. So I saw the angels as such. And I saw them as incre incredibly vulnerable. And Bruno and Otto played them very vulnerable. I think at that time you would have felt very in incomfortable uh, pretending that angels could have stopped German history or changed it. It was kind of pretending things that, uh, that to us, it would have seemed at that time to, uh, what, not serious, you know, that this kind of, this is amount of guilt just to, 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 to say uh, we are the good ones and now we are showing you how angels would have stopped that, that's, uh, that's not okay, I'm sorry, not for Germans. Maybe now it has changed, but uh, at that time, I think it was not possible for us, right? And even then, you see the angels, they cross the Berlin Wall and they go straight through it. 
But for us, when we made the film, we didn't think that in our lifetimes we would say, see that wall crumble. And for us, it was like an exp expression of a certain desire that they can walk right through and that for them, the division of the city didn't exist. And for while for us, as we're making the movie, the other part of the city was just like the other part of the moon. It was so far away. You could see it, but it was the other side of the moon. And so, but we didn't think that in our lifetime we would see that change and that in our lifetimes, people, ordinary people could cross the walls like Cassiel and Daniel were crossing the walls. And two years later, it happened. It was almost like the movie had had a dream and the dream came true. And now, of course, this entire film is like a, is like a historic document of the other side of the moon. It's like a historic document of a city that does not exist anymore. Both cities have disappeared. The one that we shot in the west and the one that we couldn't shoot in the east, they both disappeared. So, and the film is now showing, yeah, showing a historic document, strangely enough. Although it was sheer fiction, outrageous fiction, because angels are outrageously fictitious, but in this fiction, we, the film is now really a documentary. So I have a question. The, um, the soundtrack is here. <laughs> Where it's are you? Here. Ah, thank you. The soundtrack is filled with iconic acts. You have Taxi the Moon, Crime in the City Solution, Nick Cave. I wanted to ask how the concert scenes came about, if it was something that was planned beforehand or if it just happened sort of by accident. When I was preparing the film, I became friends with both The Bad Seeds and Crime and City Solution. And I saw all these crazy Australians who lived in Berlin at the time quite often. And I saw both bands perform. And Nick Cave would play almost every second night somewhere in the city. And he was a real underground hero of Berlin. And I, I really wanted him to be in the film. And also Simon Bonney, both bands I wanted to be in the film because they expressed so much what the city was about then. And the underground music movement was very big. And these guys invented grunge 10 years before, before it really happened in the and rock and roll. So, I really wanted these both bands to be in the film, and we found ways to shoot if possible. And I think both concert scenes. I was a little worried because I I figured that I had an 80 year old cameraman, and to shoot rock and roll was maybe not so easy with him. And he loved these scenes. He really loved the music. And after the film, believe it or not, he made a number of videos with new order before he went back into, into his retirement. So well, we really liked the rock and roll part of it. And the two concert scenes are among my favorite things in the film, really. I think those are very, very beautiful. I'm very proud of them. And all the other music in the film as well. And there's Laurie Anderson. There's a lot of really important music that I felt also really showed what the climate of the city was about at the time. Um, I, I wanted to ask about the, the, the decision to end the movie on an unfinished note and, um, and continue it in 93, right? In the next movie. I want to talk, talk about it. Well, when we did finish Wings of Desire, we had no idea we would make a sequel. And there was no plan. To make a sequel. I just finished, I just figured it had to be open-ended and these, and uh, Damien's life had just begun and he had just met the woman of his life and and everybody, and Kansiel was still sitting up there and the old Homer was still walking around. I figured we didn't have an ending and so 
to be continued was a way to say, well, let's see what life will have in store for them. And I just had no idea how I could possibly write the end. It, the film wasn't such that we can write the end. But there was no intention to actually continue. And that only happened when two years later the wall came down and and another two years later I realized we lived in a very different city and everything was different. And if ever you wanted to look at the city again, I figured it would be good to, to do it with the same people. I didn't really want to do a sequel as such, but I just thought it would be so poignant if we see how these characters would now live in this new place. And everybody, Bruno and Otto and even Peter Falk, they all came back and it's quite amazing to shoot. And then the second film we shot is special. We shot almost entirely in the East where we hadn't been able to shoot the first time. And he's running a pizzeria in the second time. <laughs> he has become his life. His angel's dream was to be a pizza baker. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I think uh, your film is actually a lot more about Europe than Germany itself. So I was thinking that uh, if you could explain us more uh, about the storyteller's role in your film, that would be great. The storyteller's part, the old Homer, the old, the archangel of storytelling, I really owe this to Peter Handke. Because when I first came to Peter and I told Peter the story, I have an idea of a film, two angels, and one of them falls in love and becomes a human being, Peter said, I can't help you. I'm in the middle of a novel, and this is so crazy, your idea. You have to write it yourself. I can't help you. And I was very sad, but I understood his point of view, and I left him again. And I went home, and I said, okay, I write it myself, or I don't write it myself. We just do it on a day-to-day -day basis. And then, very shortly before the first day of shooting, I, I got an envelope from Peter. Peter at the time lived in Salzburg. And I got an envelope, and Peter wrote me a letter saying, well, after you'd gone, I sort of felt sad that I couldn't help you. And I remember the story you told, so I thought I could help you anyway by writing a couple of dialogues. And I wrote a couple of monologues that maybe you can use them in the course of the film. And one of the characters that Peter had remembered was the archangel of storytelling, which I had already eliminated in my own idea of the film. So Peter had insisted that this Homer, Homer correct character should should stay in the film. So I reinstalled him, and we cast Kurt Bohr for it. And and it was really Peter who, because he wrote these texts, these interior monologues for this old man, that that I brought this character back to life. And uh, and everything that that goes through the head of the old man who is the storyteller is actually written by Peter. A lot of the other things I wrote myself, but everything concerning this, the storyteller is Peter Handke, and he is the storyteller for my generation, at least in Germany. Thank you, Wim. Thank you, Bruno. Just now, in 10 minutes, we start until the end of the world. I think it will be a fantastic occasion to see, finally, your version of the movie. Please, if you can, go and see it. Okay. Thank you. And thank you so much, Bruno, for being the Archangel, finally. And uh, I will present the film till the end of the world because it's a rare opportunity to show the director's cut of it. And I'll also be there at the end, so I'd be happy to see some of you again.
Thank you.